it's this time of year that I get, I, I, I don't know about you guys, I love this time of year. I just, I just, you know, pumpkin spice is about to come out. I'm about ready to, you know, blow the coffee trailer up and because everybody's already asking about it. How many of you are pumpkin spicers? Come on, just go ahead and just, just admit it. Just drink the Kool-Aid this morning. Yeah. Oh, it's not here yet, but it's coming. Starbucks is already talking about it. I saw it all over my news feed this morning. I'm like, here we go. I had a friend of mine, he posted this video of this, looked like a sandstorm coming into a city. Have you guys seen this? And it had a picture of a little puppy's face on it. And it, that, that was labeled pumpkin spice. And it was coming into town. And, the, and it said September uh, 1st, I think, on the deal. And it was like a city, but September 1st was the city. And here comes pumpkin spice. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, be praying for all you pumpkin spicers because you need some deliverance. That's a bondage. Anyway, uh, I'm excited you're here. It's going to be good this morning. So if you will, let's just close our eyes and let's just welcome the, the presence of God. Father, we thank you once again for your presence. We receive it today, uh, all that you have for us. We already plan in our hearts this morning to, to yield to what it is that you're saying. I know right now, even my mind wants to be distracted with thoughts of what's to come today. And so I just take control of my mind. I've got authority over my mind. And I just trust in you this morning. So I just submit my heart today to what you're going to say and what you're going to do. And so I thank you once again that you are the God that has broken through everything in my life. And I can trust you and you love to be trusted. So I pray today that we would grow in our confidence in what you say that we are and who you say that we are. Because we believe in you. And so we thank you for that this morning, and we appreciate the opportunity to come together and to worship so freely. Come on, if you believe that, say amen. Jesus' name, amen. Have you got your Bibles? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we've been in a series called The Reprogrammer. We've been talking about uh, the Holy Spirit and having him, uh, repro- how he's the one that is reprogramming us. It's not necessarily just a, uh, it is renewing your mind, that's a part of the process, but it's not just renewing your mind. It is uh, it, it, there is a, a power that has to help you carry out what you are renewing your mind to. Uh, and that word of God, it says is power, it's living. So it's not just something. So when you hear words that come from the word of God, it's not just like, hey, this is good. This is positive. It is literally life-giving. It gives life and it gives you internally a hope and expectation of something good to take place. So Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to get started. Anyone here ever been told that you are full of it? Yeah. Some of you, we won't get into what you're full of because, you know, that's not church appropriate. My dad used to always say that you're full of baloney. Anybody ever say that? Is that, yeah. Well, you know, you guys know full of baloney just means that you tell stories that probably aren't 100% true. And so baloney somehow got the attachment that you're full of it. You're full of baloney. And it just meant that you like to tell stories that, that really aren't accurate and or maybe totally accurate let's put it that way um we had a guy that we used to work with in a maintenance department he was a high school kid and and i won't tell you his name in case you know him and uh because i mean i am in this area and he's from this area and so anyway but i remember he used to come into the maintenance department in the morning before school and he'd come in there and he would just start spinning these elaborate stories about how he was in the cia now come on listen to this here's He's in the CIA, you know, and he would talk about how he's in the CIA and all these, I mean, and they were like stories. It's like, he either watched some really good movies or so anytime. And so those guys would just would prod him, you know, like, so what do you do? And so one time he was in there and they're like, well, so what do you do if they get you and they corner you? He's like, well, and just without hesitation, well, you just break their neck and you go over the wall. I mean, that was his answer. What do they do? If they you just break their neck and go over the wall, you know, that, I mean, that's, that. I was like, wow, he has thought this through. He had an answer for everything. Come on, how many of those, he was just full of baloney. Now, why was he full of baloney? So here, here's, here's where this gets to. And this is, it, it, it comes from the fact that we have such a desire to be valued and accepted that we will do about anything to get that. We will, we will, we will make up stories. Come on, have you ever made up a story for someone to accept you? Some of you are like, this is last week. Yeah. And you just make, or you embellish it to make it sound cooler, you know. I, had a, I caught a fish, but it was, you know, and you just caught a fish, you know. But it, but it makes us feel like you're a better fisherman if you caught a bigger fish. For some reason, we feel the need to impress, and we do it because we feel like if we're impressive, we get acceptance or we get valued. And that's all he was doing was just trying to push. Now, let me just say it this way. You have a built-in desire to be accepted. That's why we do that. That's why we go those routes, why we do embellish on things or we make things bigger than they are. 
Um, and we do that because we do have this built-in desire to be accepted. The key is, is how do I go about feeling that? And I can just tell you this, whatever you fill your hearts with, whatever I fill my heart with, which is basically whatever I choose to believe about myself is who or what I'll become. This is gonna be like a tough thing to kind of swallow at this moment, but I want you to just kind of gravitate to this little thought right here. I am a sum total of what I have believed about myself today. Where you have arrived at right now in your life is a sum total of what you have believed about yourself. And you're like, what? Well, and, and it's kind of hard to take, right? I mean, I, like, I'm like, oh, there's a lot of stuff I don't like about myself. The key is, though, is I believe that about myself. I believed I wasn't good enough. I believed I maybe wasn't talented enough or I wasn't smart enough or I didn't look good enough. Whatever the case was, I believed that. Therefore, I shrink the vision of God in my life or his potential in my life to only what I can allow him to, to move in is what I choose to believe about myself. You ever done something stupid and then you just start calling yourself stupid? Can I tell you this? Everybody on the planet does, does something stupid. I do it on a regular basis. But can I tell you, you're not stupid just because you did something stupid. Why? Because that's not who God says that you are. And that's what's interesting is because when you start believing that, you will, according to your heart, establish the boundary of where your potential can grow over. I know it sounds like positive thinking, but this is all God made. This is all God generated. This has nothing to do. And I'm going to show you why and how that works. Go to Acts chapter 2. So before the infilling of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, we filled our hearts with counterfeits. That means things that look like they will bring what we desire. Uh, whatever felt right, whatever felt good. Uh, one scripture back, and I believe it's one of the kings said, uh, because there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in their own sight. And what that means is this, when I, there's no king in my life, then I will do whatever feels like is good for me. And how many knows not always what I feel is good for me leads me on a good path. Sometimes I have to get my feelings in alignment with truth because sometimes I don't feel good enough. How many of you ever felt good and not good enough? But because I don't feel like I'm good enough doesn't mean I am not good enough. It just means that my emotions have interpreted something that says, you're just not good. But the truth says that I am. So before the infilling, we use counterfeits. Let's go to Acts 2, let's read verse 1. I know I've said it like five <laughs> times, but let's just read it now. The day of Pentecost had fully come. They were with all, I wasn't good at English. They were all with one accord in one place. Okay, now I want you to just listen to what was going on. They were all with one accord, had one mind, and they were in one place. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and one set upon each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So I want you to kind of look at some of these words. It says they were filled. That word filled means they were furnished, they were imbued, they were influenced, or they were supplied. Now I want you to think about uh, when you experienced, or let me just say it this way, they experienced God. They felt the presence of God. They felt something that was uh, God or godly. So how many of you remember when you've experienced God? Now I need you to think back because you probably, and, and let me say this in, in, a, in a very kind way, that we've probably got into a routine of life with God that sometimes you haven't experienced him in a long time. What I mean by that is you haven't really felt the presence of God. You've actually just attended where the presence of God was. Can I, is that okay to say that? And so, and because I haven't experienced it, I remember, okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you experience of mine, okay? You want to hear this? So I come from a charismatic church background. And so I went to a conference one time and I was always like anti, you know, in charismatic church, we fail down, you know, pray for people, we're falling over and all this. You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay. So anyway, so I remember I was the guy that, you know, when I first started in the charismatic church, I thought this is what we do. So they put your hands and you just go down. You just go down. There's somebody back here, you just go into their hands and God's going to work on you. It's like, you know, boom. Lay down there and he can get you work. It's like surgery, anesthesia, you're out. So I would just go for it, boom, I'd hit back. And I would just be sitting there thinking, should I get up now or should I just stay here longer? You know, so I'm going through this whole thing, okay? I know you guys are like, what? what? This is what I was going through, okay? Because I thought everybody else is still laying, I'll just stay down here because it looks like God's doing something. But I'm actually just thinking about how long I should lay there till I get up. All right, so long story short, I got into this mode where I thought I'm not going down. 
I'm going to stand up and I'm going to do this until God does something to make me fall down, right? I mean, that's a good strategy. It's even better strategy than going down before. That's like the extremes of both ends. So then it's like when they would pray for me, I'm like leaning into it. You have to push a little harder because I'm not going down. So they're, and then, you know, and some they get all excited. So, so I remember this. So I went to a conference. I'll set all that up to, I went to a conference one time and uh, it's a big conference. And, and so they asked people to come up if you want prayer. So I always went up because I always want something. I always wanted something. I always needed something from God. Uh, and so I would go up there and I remember thinking, I'm not going down unless you knock me down, right? I already had this thought. So anyway, so how many of you have ever had your eyes closed and you got surprised by something that you weren't ready for? So I didn't know that they were in front of me. So they laid their hands on me and I don't know if it caught me off guard or if I really went down, but anyway, I, I, I hit the ground, okay? So I hit the ground and I start to try to get back up because I'm not, I'm not gonna lay down here. And I start to get back up and I just lose it emotionally. I mean, I'm just, I just start boohooing over the, you know, and you can cry a little bit better in front of people you don't know because you know there's like a bunch of people so you can let it out, you know. So I would just boohoo. And I'm sure that I had all this stuff trapped in me over the year of pastoring and I just hadn't had a chance to let it out. And here, here it came, all right? So I'm having this encounter with, with God and I just, and, and this is what I, I literally heard this in my heart, okay? So try to stick with me. I try to get back up, guys, literally. And I, I you, ever, you ever felt so exhausted you can't get up? Or maybe you're so tired you can't. And I just felt like, I, I felt so heavy that I couldn't get up. This is what I felt like the Lord said to me in that moment. If I wanted you on the ground, there was nothing you could do about it. And I was like, whoa. So I tried to get up again. I couldn't get up. I start losing it. And this is what I started losing about. And I want you to think about this because I was experiencing the presence of God. There was nothing said over me. I was just encountering and connecting with God in a way that only he knew. The people around me had no idea what I was going through. Why? Because I wanted it to be real. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I wanted it to be real. I did not want it to be inauthentic. I didn't want it to be an act. I didn't want it to be going through the motion I wanted it to be genuine. And I know that that's what this generation and even us, we want to experience something real. We don't want counterfeit. I don't want going through the motion. I don't want to go to church and be like, all right, here we go. Let's go home. I want to experience God's presence. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean you're falling on the ground. That doesn't mean that you're shouting and running. That doesn't mean that. But it also doesn't mean that I'm just standing there. Do you, do you see where I'm, I'm, I'm tracking so far? So what does it look like? What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? So they were encountering or experiencing the presence of God. Now, here's what I want you to see. It filled their hearts. Now, why did it fill just them in that room? There was, a, there was thousands of people all over that area. They were in a room, in a place, the upper room, and they were waiting because the Lord told them to go tarry there until I send you the promise of the Father. So they went there and they, and they tarried, the word says. That word tarried actually means this. It means to sit down or to settle. So they were just settled in the place of waiting for God to do something because they had no idea what to expect, okay? So they're praying and all of a sudden they had this encounter with the presence of God and they are filled with the spirit. They begin to interact with, they begin to speak with other tongues. Other people begin to hear what they're saying and it just begins to become this mighty transformation of a people. 3,000 people added to the kingdom of God in one moment, okay? It's crazy. Now, I was thinking about this process, but why did it just happen to those in that room? Here's the answer to that. Because they were the ones that were tarrying or they were the ones that were settled or I'm gonna say it this way, they were the ones that were yielded to the presence of God or to the spirit or to the promise of God. He said, I'm gonna send you a comforter. I'm gonna pour out my spirit and he's gonna endue you with power. They had settled within their hearts. I want that. And they were open for it, okay? So what I wanna do is what I want you to do this morning is I want you to, I want you to open up your heart to experience God, all right? The reason is, is because if you've never experienced God, I'll just say that this way, because I, I want you to think back to your time when you experienced God, because I can promise you it changed your life in that moment. 
And you will never forget it. Why? Because it was impactful, because it made a difference in your life. And, and so what happens is then we think that experience means that we just go through the motions because we're trying to endure. Can I tell you that God wants you to experience him all the time, every day? Not just one moment, not just when you're on Sundays. Matter of fact, he wants you to experience him outside of Sunday. Sunday's just a time we get to come together, but he wants you to experience him every day. What does that mean? It means to, to experience the presence and the power and the love and the goodness of God every single day of your life. That's the key to staying strong in your faith is experiencing the presence. The less or the more your hope gets deferred or your experience with God gets deferred, your heart, it says, becomes sick meaning it begins to get filled with unbelief or gets filled with delay and thinking, this ain't gonna work. How many of you have been believing for something for a long time in your life and it still hasn't happened? And you almost have come to the point in your life like, ah, it's probably never gonna happen anyway. Why, why think about it? Why? Because it's delayed or it's in the process that's not here yet. So we get a little frustrated and we're like, maybe just God's not doing it. So I want, you to, I want to show you something, how we stay filled or how do we live filled with the presence of God. Anybody interested in that? Okay. Two of you, okay, that's okay, we can get there. So to be filled with the Spirit means to be yielded. Did anybody here have a problem with a subject when you were in school? Like just any subject. What was your worst subject? Just yell it out. All of them, okay, that didn't help at all, Aaron. <laughs> anybody else? Math, read, algebra, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, X is, yeah, whatever, that's not even math. Yeah, <laughs> just one class. Okay, I struggled with English, obviously. Uh, so I struggled with English, and so I did not understand the point of breaking down sentences. Who cares? As long as I can talk it, we're fine. I can communicate to you. So I, I struggled with English. You know, I didn't care about reading, reading uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Didn't care. I had to read it. How many of you had to read it? Still don't remember. I remember Boo Radley is the only name I remember of the entire book. And I thought it was going to be about killing a mockingbird. <laughs> Nothing to do with killing a mockingbird. So it's like this big court battle of some kind. I'm like, what? So anyway, I didn't want interested at all. I was interested in playing sports, right? School's a mean to get to sports. So why was it so, I didn't have to work at trying to play sports. Why? Because my heart's always yielded to it. It wasn't like, hey, Josh, you want to play cut ball? Uh, I'm not sure if I want to. Well, yeah, always. Josh, you want to break down a sentence? No, never. All I wanted to do was think about playing baseball Oh, is that a cute girl over there? You know, is my hair messed up? Do I smell? You know, that, that was more important to me than breaking down a sentence. Why was I not interested or able to receive the English? Because I simply wasn't yielded to it. I would not, they're talking about it. My mind's like, first and third, two outs. <laughs> you know, and she's breaking down a sentence. I'm not thinking one thing about what she's saying. Hey, Josh, what's the answer to this? Uh... <laughs> Four. You know, just, you just start naming things. Why? Because I'm not connected. So I want you to understand something. So when you're in an environment and you're trying to connect with the presence of God, you got to kind of get this, okay? Is, is it's important that you're yielded. That means that your heart is deferring to or focused upon or open to what it is that's about to take place. Okay, go to Romans 6. I want to I read this verse to you really quick. Romans 6. Here we go. Here we go. Romans 6, and we're going to go to verse 16. I'm going to read it next. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to want to look it up. I'm going to read it in the King James Version. So this is going to read in the Old English way. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to right. So he says, like, you, got the, you got the authority, you got the freedom, bless you, you got the freedom to choose who you want to serve. Now that word is yield to that. It means you yield to who you want to serve. Now that word serve does not mean that you're a slave. It means you're a bond servant. A bond servant was defined as someone who willfully ties themselves to somebody of their own free will. It's not they're doing it because they're forced to do it. So a lot of times when you see the word slave or servant, you think that God is forcing you to serve him. That's not what that word means. It's a bond servant. It means I'm willfully tying myself to him to serve him out of my choice. So he says, who you choose, who you yield to, to be a bond servant to is what you'll end up producing. So we, we once again see this picture of yielding or submitting. You guys, when you're driving, you got to yield. That means that when you're getting ready to come on and people are driving, you have, to, you have to let them or let them go first or allow them the priority. 
And that's what God is trying to show us is we have to allow God's presence to be priority. Because what is usually priority in my life? Me, my mind, my thoughts, my issues, my stuff. And so what happens is I become the priority. I lose sight of his priority or his truths, which causes me to sit there and always try to solve problems. How many of you lay in bed at night trying to solve problems all the time? Or maybe you're just sitting in your car and all you do is try to solve problems all the time. I'm going to encourage you to try something. Instead of solving problem, just put some worship music on and just sing to them. See what happens. See what changes. Because I can promise you this. You can sit in your car for hours trying to solve a problem and never get to a solution. All you're doing is just rehearsing the worry of it. Come on, that's what happens. It just falls apart. It just falls Why? Because my mind is not the, doesn't have the power to overcome the, the challenges I'm facing because they're not physical challenges, they're spiritual challenges. So they have to come from the Spirit of God. Now, here's what's interesting. The idea of yielding. So I like to watch. How many of you get stuck in watching videos? Just go ahead and lift, just lift your hand in the church because we all do it, right? That's why you're in a bathroom for an hour and a half. <laughs> you're watching videos. Okay, so anyway, so I like to watch drain videos where they unclog drains. <laughs> now, let me, let me define what I'm saying because you guys are like, what? So have you ever seen like a parking lot that the water's backed up in? And they're like, hey, let's, and the guy's out there and he's like just pulling this. And next thing you know, all the water comes draining. I'm like, wow, it's just totally great. Well, then there's these other drains where like, this, like a sewer pipe or some kind of thing's backed up. They'll just roto-rooter that baby. And next thing you know, we got flow. And man, for me, I'm like, wow. That is just great. I spent 20 minutes watching that stuff and just like, wow, there's a lot of people working on drains around here and filming it uh, because of guys like myself. Now, here's what's interesting about that whole story. Because, hey, listen, don't, don't look at me like I'm weird. That's like a normal video compared to what you guys are watching, right? So anyway, so do you know why drains are clogged up? Think about this. Because usually they're full of crap. I want you to think about that. I wasn't going to use that word, but I thought that's a good church word. Okay, now think about it. Now, if it's a drain that's like a, like a storm drain, it's usually filled with trash and dead things. See, you guys thought I was just watching. Listen, God was teaching me something through this whole thing. Okay, you want to watch these videos? Let me teach, teach you something instead of wasting your time. Here we go. Why? Because everything that interrupts the flow is usually something that's dead or it's not even worth the time of spending to mess with it. It's waste. So think about all the things that we waste our time thinking about or the dead things that we try to do to get God to do something and we just spend all that effort and it does nothing for us. The only way that you can allow the flow to happen is to remove all the trash. This is what's interesting. How do I move the trash? Well, spiritually, they have to dig it out the physically. They have to dig it out and and pull through there. The best one you need to watch is you need to watch them fill or clean out a, uh, a whistle. I call them whistles. Or the, you know, the, is they'll put a spare tire on the other side and they'll pull it through with a tractor. Unbelievable what comes out. I mean, uh, you're going to be watching them. I promise you when you get home, you'll be like, wow. Yeah. Why? Because there's freedom when there's flow. Can I just tell you this? This is going to get a little bit gross, but you know why you don't feel good sometimes? It's because you're backed up. Come on. You know why? Because God created you to intake, to experience, and to get rid of. Watch this. Now listen, I know you're just like, what? Why did he create you like that? Because if you just ingest and you experience, but you never get rid of, you'll get sick really fast. Whoa. Because if you're not generous, if you're not giving away from yourself and you're just only keeping, you'll get unhealthy really fast. Or if you're never ingesting, but you're only getting rid of, you'll get unhealthy just as fast. Why? Because that's part of the balance of God. We receive it. That's why it's important to stay filled with the Spirit of God because if not, and when I say filled, it means I'm just yielded to the promise of God or yield to the presence or the experience of God. Okay, so he can feel that and it allows me to release, right? So the Holy Spirit's job is to help guide us into the truth, what it is in our situation, right? Okay, here's go a little further. John chapter seven. I didn't have any notes about the backup stuff. So anyway, so how do we access it? How do we yield? So let's get a little more detailed of how we yield. John chapter seven. All right, I'm hustle. I'll hustle here. John seven. 
Look at verse 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So I'll just say it this way. When he's saying that, it doesn't mean you're thirsty for water. He's like, if anybody's desperate and they are looking to be satisfied, okay? He said, come to me and drink. He who believes in me. Now watch this. He who believes in me. Belief is connected to what, how we'll receive it. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Out of his heart, out of who he is, will flow life. So notice that he's saying that what your life flow is connected to is not outside of you, it's within you. Because God lives in you. And he said, your, your answer to the abundant life or the joy of life is not coming from the outside. It's not from being successful out here. It's from being successful in here. And when I am yielded to the spirit of God, to the joy of the Lord, or to him being my source, his death, burial, and resurrection, him being my completeness, then what happens is I can constantly be filled with the spirit of God, which puts me in a position to be joyful when I wake up in the morning, to be joyful when things aren't going great around me, right? Because that's the key to the abundant life. Now, so I have to know that. So let me just take you into to like a worship setting, okay? So like a worship setting at church. And I say worship because really our life is supposed to be a life of worship, meaning that everything we do is an expression of, of our gratitude towards him. So like our life of worship. So, you know, when you, we try to create an environment in during worship that's conducive for people to connect with God. Meaning this, we just try to present it so that we can sing to the Lord, we can worship him. Because how many knows he likes to be sang to? Right? Ladies, can I just ask you a question? If your husband could sing, wouldn't you love for him to sing to you? I know we have to just employ George Strait to do it now because we're like, I can't sing. So here, George, you sing to her. I'll just point at her. <laughs> so I'm thinking about you. Anyway, uh, but we, why? Because there's something about it because it's a, it's a way of connecting. Like it's not really the song they're singing to you because you probably didn't write the words, but it's the fact that you're connecting with that person, Right? that causes you to yield to that so that love can be exchanged, that the heart can open and that you can receive that, that company of each other, that enjoyment of each other. Now, this is what's interesting about that is, is it's the same thing with God. When we sing to him, it's not that that's kind of the warm up, like we're stretching to get the, into the presence of God. It is literally our opportunity to forget everything and just sing to him to just tell him what I don't have the words for, but someone did a really good job of telling me what I feel, right? That's why you listen to music anyway. That's why you listen to those. It's because you feel what they're feeling. You just can't put words into it, but you relate to what they're saying. Oh my God. And so you sing. And what happens when you sing, it actually opens your heart to connect with that. So what God is trying to say, or what we're trying to see, so in the worship environment, when we're singing, it's not just about singing songs to him because that's, we call that going through the motions. If I just sing, because that's what we do at church, we just sing. If I am not intentional about my connecting with God, whether I have to close my, I have to close my eyes a lot. Why? Because I start watching people. I'm watching them and they're like, hey, yeah, they're clapping off rhythm. What's going on there? You know, and, and uh, but so I have to close my eyes. Why? Because I don't need any distraction away from that. How many knows when you got your eyes closed and somebody bumps you, you're like immediately distracted. Why? Because it's like, what was that? And so what we try to do is we try to create an environment so there's no distraction for your worship. So that you can connect with God in such a way so you can experience him every single day. So when we sing songs like, I still got a reason to praise. What we're trying to do is we're trying to connect with him and let him know that no matter what I face, I've still got a reason to worship you because you are so good and no matter what I, I've been, I've at my worst, you are still good. And I'm thankful that you're good. And I don't know how to tell you that other than I'm just gonna let him tell you and I'm gonna sing with him on how I feel and let that experience, and I can promise you this, you'll watch your heart connect with God on a way, you'll start to receive from him, you'll start to feel the joy of the Lord, the presence of God, why? Because that's connecting with God. That's what connecting looks like. It's the same thing. If I'm distracted in a relationship and sitting across and Aaron and I are trying to talk about something, I'm like, Aaron's gonna be like, dude, put the phone down, seriously. Is it that important? No, I'm just checking my uh, bank account. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so instead of putting that aside, what, that's what it is. It's a distraction. Why? Because my priority of solving is I'm yielding to something else other than the encounter with him. So like in worship, what happens to me is I'll be like singing and then I'll start thinking about, man, I got to make whipping cream this afternoon. But anyway, you know, God, you're so good. And God, I got some Oreos too because Oreos wrap bad out of those too. I got to crush those things up. I hate crushing those things up. And so I'm going through this whole scenario in my mind. How many of those, can you relate to that at all? And this is in church leading worship. Now I'm at my end. Oh my God, got to get that done today. And it's amazing what your mind can do because I don't intentionally say, you know what? I'm going to yield to the spirit of God. I'm going to yield to the presence of God this morning. Amen? Isn't that good? Let's go to Peter chapter five. Let's read this really quick. So set our heart. It's important to set our heart to yield. I can't solve my problems. Only he can, or only the strength comes from him can allow me to endure through. First Peter five, verse nine. Let me just read it up here for the sake of time. Resist him. So this is how we, we, we yield to him. We resist him. We resist that opportunity. But this is interesting. How do I resist that? Okay, and, and I'll say it this way. If you like me telling you, okay, because we think resisting that means just stop doing that, okay? So if you're distracted, stop being distracted, right? How many of you got good parenting skills like that, right? Oh, you're throwing a fit? Just quit throwing a fit. Now, why do we do that? Because that's the answer. That's truly the answer is stop throwing the fit. But the reality is, is how do I get to that answer? This is what we do in church a lot. We just tell you what you're supposed to do, but we don't actually give you the answer to it. It's like, catch the freaking ground ball. But how do I do that? Resist him, steadfast in faith. Why here? Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced. So this is telling you how you resist him. How do you resist steadfast in the faith? Watch. Knowing the same sufferings. So he's telling us this idea of how do I resist? I do it steadfastly in faith. So faith is my answer to resisting. I don't stop doing this. I change it into a different yield, which is I have confidence in him. See, a lot of times we were taught in charismatic backgrounds, we gotta, we gotta whip the devil. So we gotta tell him off. We gotta tell him what you think. Devil, you back off, Jesus' name. So, and the reason is, is because he says this, you don't have to fight with him because he's defeated. All you have to do is stand in what God said. That's what resisting him, steadfast in faith looks like. So notice I'm not spending time fighting something. I am just standing in a different yield. I'm yielding my instruments not to fight that battle, but to fight this battle which is I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to have confidence in you, right? Because telling somebody to not worry, how many knows that doesn't work, right? Tell your wife, hey, don't worry about that. She's like, yeah, get out of the house. <laughs> Why? Because that's not solving any problem. It doesn't help you. It just tells you what the answer should be is for not to worry. But he tells us, why do I not have to worry about it? Because he already knows you have a need before you ever got to that worry. And his answer has already been promised if we just trust and yield to his way. And I promise you he'll bring it to pass. See, that's how interesting, that's how easy the process is. Let's go to Joshua chapter one. Here's a quick example of how this works scripturally. Okay, Joshua one, look at verse, uh, I think it's uh, three through five. Every place, so this is, they're about to go into the promised land, okay? So he says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given you, as I said to Moses, this is awesome. I, as I said to Moses, I'm, every place you go, I've given it to you, okay? There's the promise. From the wilderness, he names all the boundaries. Verse five, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. I don't know about you, that's pretty awesome. I mean, that's pretty awesome. He's like, listen, check this out. Everything, everywhere your foot goes is yours. Not only that, nobody will be able to stand against you. How about that as a football speech or a basketball game speech? Hey, check this out. Nobody can beat you. Now, we do that to try to convince them that they could possibly win this game. God's like, hey, listen, I'm a little different because when you're connected to me, you can't lose and you won't lose. So he's given Josh this speech saying this, here's the promise and here's what I need you to do. I need you to cross that Jordan. But I need you to cross the Jordan knowing that when you walk over there, it's yours. And there's not one person, big, small, big army that can stand against you all the days of your life. The same way that I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you as well, okay? This is awesome. Joshua is a type of Jesus, by the way. I just let you know, okay? Check this out. So think about, so uh, my parents used to do this. Here's, here, oh, actually, let's go to verse eight, then I'll read, I'll tell you my story. So this is what he asked them to do. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. So he said, how do you get that, how do you get that mentality? He said, you're going to have to meditate on what I've said. 
That means you're going to have to make it a priority of thought that I think on the promises of God versus my worries. And how do I do that? Why? Because it's just a choice. This is, the, this is the power of freedom. God has given us freedom, and that freedom is the ability to choose what we think or how we think. Now, sometimes our mind will try to slide over. We have the power to say, uh, you know what? This is what the truth says. And when we believe the truth, the Holy Spirit is empowering us to overcome those thoughts, right? So he says this, I want you to, to meditate day and night that you may observe. So meditating on it day and night brings about observation, meaning that we will begin to observe to do that or do what it says that we're going to do. All that is written for, then you'll make your way prosperous. So he says, you got to meditate on it. He said, and then you'll start to observe it. And he said, check this out. And you're going to make your way prosperous and you're going to have good success. He said, but you can't get there without meditating on it. I can tell you this, if, if you've experienced some failures in your life, it's probably because you meditated on failure a lot. You were afraid of failing it. Oh, I, I am totally know how that feels. Totally always thinking about, it. I'm not going to do well in this. But I would do it anyway, hoping that I wouldn't do bad. But he says this, the more you meditate on a day and night, he said, you'll start to observe it. You'll start to make that part. He said, then you're going to make your way prosperous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You may just need to write that down and start just thinking about that. When you get overwhelmed, just think about, man, I'm going across this Jordan. Whatever your problem is, you're going to cross over it. He said, you're going to cross over it because God promised you that you're going to cross over it. And that's how you're going to cross over it. You're going to think about what God promised you and the strength that comes from him. And it's going to allow you to overcome that. Let me give you an example. So our parents, we used to tell Amber and I, they'd say, hey, listen, you know, this weekend, uh, maybe Monday or Tuesday, we're going to go to the Tulsa State Fair. How many of you like going to the fair? It's about fair season, right? Yeah. So we get all excited. How many knows that week of going to the Tulsa State Fair, it was not hard to get out of bed. It wasn't hard to get up, go to school. I was fired up, had a test, didn't really care. Didn't, didn't affect me. Why? All I could think about was going to the fair. Like third, like Friday night, I start laying clothes out, right? You know, shorts, shirt, fair shoes. Because all I could think about was ri what rides we're going to ride. And they may have lizards there because I always wanted to buy a lizard every stinking year. And I got one one year, one year. And uh, I didn't take care of it like five minutes after I got it. Because I was like, he doesn't do anything but sit there. So anyway, don't buy a lizard. And so, but I would lay all that stuff out, right? And I would just be so excited. Why? So test didn't matter. Nothing stressful mattered. It wasn't hard to go to bed. Why? Because there was a goal and it was something I was yielded to. I was ready for it. Now let's fast forward to the Monday after the fair. Mom had to wake me up with a spray bottle again. Now my mom shot me with a spray bottle. I don't know if you guys ever did that. That's the lady that's leading the kids, by the way. She would shoot me. She would shoot me. She was standing across the room. She'd give me like two or three like, minutes, like, Josh, hey, you need to wake up. I wouldn't do it. So she'd just like, phew, 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 from all the way across the room. She'd let me have it. You know, I'd get mad. But let me, let me show you the difference. When I was expecting and I was yielded to because I had, this, I had this, this dream or this thing in my heart, I was meditating on it, thinking about it. It was not hard to be that. But the moment it was gone, and I was back to what I call reality. It was right back to, I can't hardly get out of the bed because I'm so exhausted. You know why? Because the next morning you are dreading what it is you're about to go into. And because you meditate on it, I'm going to be so tired in the morning. How many of you have ever said, I'm going to be so tired you woke up really tired? What if you said in the morning when I wake up, I'm not going to be tired? I wonder if we tried it, if it would actually work. Hmm. I've never tried it. I don't think I want to try it. Right? That, isn't that the answer? I don't think, I think I want to be gripey in the morning because I'm tired. But what if we just exchanged our hearts? Because I'm going to show you this really quick. Here's the last couple of verses, John chapter four. John chapter four, look at verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, he will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he said, that water that's going to be in you is a fountain of that is springing up to life every day. So right now you sit in this room with a life fountain inside of you as if you have your own water fountain that satisfies you constantly inside of you. And this is what it says in Isaiah. This is the cool part about Isaiah. Watch this. He says this, behold, God is my salvation. God is my salvation. He's my saving grace. He's my wholeness. He's my health. He's my peace. And I will trust and not be afraid for Yah the Lord is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Verse three, here's the deal. Therefore, 
with joy. Now here's the deal. He said, first of all, this is what God is to me. He is my this. He is yielding to the fact that God is his salvation. He is his source. He is his strength. And he says, therefore, with joy, I will draw water from the wells of salvation. He said, I'm going to draw from that well that's inside of me. How do I draw from that? Because I'm yielded to the idea or the fact or the truth that God is my salvation. He is my joy and he is my everything. Isn't that good? And he said, that's how we draw from that. It can't be that simple, right, Josh? It cannot be that simple. Can I tell you? It is that simple. Worry is that simple. And worry is just the counterfeit of faith. Think about it. Worry is easy to just think about it. I can tell you this, God is easy to think about. Think about your life and the difference of your hope would be if I thought about the goodness of God always. Or I thought about my theme was about him and not about my circumstances. So what my goal is this morning is to let us know that we can be filled with the spirit of God. Ever filled, the scripture would say. I could be ever filled with the spirit of God continually. I don't know about you, but that's a lot better than feeling the way that I feel a majority of my days, right? To be filled with the spirit of God. I want you to stand to your feet. Next couple minutes. Hey, as you stand, I want you to just close your eyes, if you will, and just kind of...